Good morning. All right, the kids, yep, kids are all taking off. And good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to Hope Community Fellowship. And thank you for choosing to come and worship the Lord with us this morning. If this is your first time with us, we're glad that you're here. And if it's not your first time with us, well, welcome back anyway. We're glad that you're here as well. So we're currently in a series about the five functions of the church, which are also functions that disciples, faithful followers of Jesus, should be doing as well. We've discussed worship, instruction, and fellowship. And so this week, we're going to be ta taking a look at evangelism. Our primary scripture is going to come from the book of Acts, chapter 8. We're going to start out in verse 26, going all the way down through 40. So please join me there in your Bible if you brought your Bibles with you. So what does evangelism mean? I mean, does the Bible even say anything about us needing to evangelize? I mean, most of the time when we think about evangelism, we always think about people like Billy Graham. I mean, great evangelists like him. I mean, I think big tents and, you know, a preacher in there, you know, shouting at everybody. And that's what we think of when we think of evangelism. And I mean, most of us think, well, wait, hold up. I can't preach like that. I mean, I'm not a preacher. That's what we pay the preacher for, to come up and to preach like that for us. I'm a shy person. I don't really like talking to people. I don't really know enough about the Bible to get a conversation going with somebody about the Bible. I would just like to keep my religious views to myself. I don't want to push my religious views on anybody else. Let's not talk about politics or religion. Neither one of them. And i got to be honest with you. These are compelling arguments and reasons why you shouldn't have to evangelize. They're compelling. And they're also not true. Even worse, not only are they not true, they're unbiblical. They go against what the Bible tells us. If you truly have placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, if you have submitted your life to Him, and if you're following Him, then you have an understanding of the good news. Because without it, you couldn't. The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology defines evangelism as the proclamation of the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ with a view of bringing about the reconciliation of the sinner to God the Father through the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the dictionary says. Now, what the actual Greek words are in the Bible when we have evangelism is, that Greek word right there is euangelion. And euangelion, it means good news. That's all evangelism means is good news. It also comes from the Greek verb of that word, Euangelizimai. That's a hard one. I, I hate when I do these Greek words because it's hard to pronounce some of these. But what that word means, it's the verb portion of it. It means actually go and do something. It means to announce or proclaim to bring good news. So to evangelize and evangelism, it simply means bring the good news. That's all you got to do is bring the good news with you. So before we read our primary passage, let's ask the Lord for His blessing over our time as we get into His Word today and study it. Please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we, as we get ready to go into Your Word, Lord, and we look at the Holy Scripture, Father, just pray that You will soften our hearts. Soften our hearts to receive Your Word for what it is. Help us to understand it. Lord, 
Open our eyes to your word. Open our ears to hear your word and see the work that you are doing in our lives. It's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Okay, so the Bible uses the word evangelist three times. That's all you're going to find it in the Bible, okay? Paul tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. But the only person in the Bible actually called an evangelist is Philip. And Philip is the person that we're going to use today as a good example to us about how to do evangelism. So, and before we get to our primary verse, I want to start with this one first. In Acts 8, 4, and 5, it says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. So I wanted to read that passage to you first because it gives us context for, for the passage that we're getting ready to study. You see, Philip, the person called an evangelist in the Bible, he was not an apostle of Jesus Christ. He came along after that. Philip is one of the seven men who were chosen by the apostles to be the first deacons in the church. In the church there at Jerusalem, Philip was chosen to be a deacon. He was chosen with another man named Stephen. They were both part of the seven. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. He's the one who, who got stoned to death for, for his stance on Christ. So, after he was stoned to death, a guy named Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, he starts seeking and arresting people within Jerusalem who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And he starts hunting down men and women who have done this, putting them in jail and killing them for their faith. So, this happens to spread everybody out from Jerusalem because a lot of those people who had chose to follow Jesus and place their faith in Him as their Savior, they have to leave Jerusalem or be killed, face the same fate that Stephen had. So Philip takes off and he heads on down into Samaria. Now if you guys remember from everything that I've preached, the Samaritans are like, the ones that the Jews really, really hate. And that's what the Bible says, that the Jews hated the Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans so bad, they wouldn't even like walk through their country. They would go hundreds of miles out of their way to go around Samaria. But Philip knew that it was his job to take the good news of Jesus Christ even to those people that they hated. Indeed, that was the commission that Jesus Christ had given them to take that message into Samaria. So that's where we're going to find Philip when we open up with our primary scripture here. He's gone down into Samaria. That's where he is right now when he gets this message. So please join me in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. And it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candate, which means queen of the Ethiopians. So Philip didn't question what it was that he was supposed to do. He just obeyed. Even if the call seemed bizarre, followers of Jesus follow what they're told to do. Now you've got to understand, we don't have angels these days telling us what to do. Not saying that they couldn't, not saying it couldn't happen, 
But typically anymore, we don't have angels telling us what to do. We have something better. We have the Holy Spirit of God that indwells within us that prompts us and tells us what to do. If we're sensitive to Him and we are listening to what He is trying to tell us. If we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, He will provide us the opportunities to share the good news. Now as we continue in this story, in the next verse it says, This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He's talking about the eunuch. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, Go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading the Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. This is opportunity evangelism at its finest. I mean, Philip was always looking for a situation and to turn the situation into an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Those who are not looking for the opportunity will seldomly ever find the opportunity to share the good news. So maybe if you're not finding an opportunity in your life to share the good news with somebody, perhaps it could be because you are not looking for an opportunity to share that good news with somebody else. I mean, listen, many people would have heard this eunuch. He's in his chariot and he's reading from the book of Isaiah. And most people probably would have said something like, oh, well, there's a good, there's a good religious man. He's reading from the Bible. There's nothing for me here to do because this man's already, you know, in a relationship with God. But you see, we see from this passage, Philip took nothing for granted. Philip at least asked him the question, do you understand what you're reading? You see, we look at a lot of people who go to church all the time. People who are praying all the time. People who are reading their Bible all the time. And we make assumptions that they actually understand what they're doing. And we should never make assumptions about somebody's spiritual condition based on what we see. We need to actually take a look a little bit deeper to find out what is actually going on in other people's lives, whether it be good or bad. And that's what we need to be prepared to do. As we continue on in verse 32 of this passage, it says, this is the passage of Scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Then the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself? or someone else. And then Philip engaged the eunuch. And listen, I tell people all the time, everybody that you ever meet, everybody, you need to look at them and you need to see them as an E. You need to see a big old E right across their forehead, I guess. Because you need to look at everybody and see an E on them. Okay, And what that means is, Somewhere in your conversation, you're looking to make an assessment of what their spiritual condition is. I told you we should never assume this, but somewhere in the conversation, you should be trying to get to ascertain what their spiritual state is. The Holy Spirit inside of you is going to help you to discern, am I speaking to a brother or sister in Christ? Or am I speaking to someone who has yet to place their faith in Jesus Christ? And based on what you decide, 
you're going to do one of two E's to them. If that's somebody that you believe has not placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to evangelize that person. Somehow you are going to lead that conversation in a direction where you're going to get to tell them the good news about what Christ has done for us. And if you think that that person is a brother or sister in Christ, you're going to see them as an E as well. Because you're going to encourage that person. Because you know what? Everybody needs a little bit of encouragement every once in a while. And you're going to let them know, keep up the work, fight the good fight, you're doing good there. Either way, it doesn't matter whether they are in Christ or whether they're not in Christ. You need to move that conversation at one point or another towards Christ. Just so that you can bring Christ into the conversation. My friends that are here from the Legion, they'll always let you know that, you know what, every time that I go down to the Legion, I'm always looking for somebody to ask me, hey, how's the church going or anything else? Because that gives me the open door that nobody else in there may want to hear about it, but everybody in the Legion is going to hear about how the church is doing because I'm going to bring Jesus to them at that point. And you need to be sensitive to how the Holy Spirit moves in your life and gives you the opportunity every single day just like that. As we continue in the verses here, starting off there, uh, we're actually at verse 35. It says, Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. That's evangelism right there sharing the good news about Jesus. I mean, Philip took a passage from the Old Testament, from the law, from that time back then. Philip took a passage from there and explained to the eunuch about Jesus. Because God's Scripture is good from, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We can explain Jesus through any of that. We see in the next verse, right there where it says in verse 36, it says, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now listen. Obviously, at some point in their conversation, as they're riding in the chariot, Philip's explaining all these passages to him when he's explaining Jesus to this eunuch. I am quite sure because of what happened here, that at some point in their conversation, the eunuch, or, or Philip, explained baptism since Christ's resurrection. you got to remember, Philip's going to explain baptism to him in relation to Jesus Christ. Because you see, I'm quite sure that the eunuch probably understood the baptism of John the Baptist. Because, by the way, at that time, it was the greatest thing going around in, in their religion. You know, John the Baptist was out there <clears throat> baptizing, baptizing in the Jordan River. Listen to what Mark 1, verses 4 and 5 say about what John was doing. This is what the eunuch would have understood about baptism. It says, and so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. You see, John was, John was the hottest thing around going in religion at that time. It said that, it said that all the Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out. By the way, that's about a five or seven mile walk from Jerusalem out to the baptism site at the Jordan River where they were doing that at. And everybody was going out there to John. People in the first century understood about a baptism of repentance. It was to show when they would go out there to John, because you got to remember now, these people are under the law. The law is Judaism. These people understood 
when they went out there and were baptized by John, they were recognizing that, listen, the law cannot save me. The law can do nothing for me. The law is, is not what's going to get me to heaven. Faith, my faith, just like Father Abraham, is going to get me there. And these people were being baptized saying, look, I am going the wrong way. I'm following the law, but I recognize the law is not going to save me. I repent, and I'm turning away from that. Father God, I'm coming towards you. And that's what they were doing. But since Christ has been resurrected now in this scene, the baptism is different now. Because now what Philip had explained to that eunuch is that now Christ has risen. When we get baptized, it is an outward symbol of something internal that we've already done. We've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, and now we are being baptized. So don't, don't ever get this confused. The baptism that you're going to get does not save you. It cannot save you. So now the eunuch is going to be baptized, because by the way, that is what Christ commanded. The eunuch is going to be baptized confessing that Jesus Christ is his Savior, and submitting his life to Christ forever and ever, being obedient to him. So there in verse 39, we see that when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So Philip, after he baptizes the unit, he's taken away and we find him continuing to spread the gospel all throughout Samaria until he reaches Caesarea. So he continues doing what he has been called to do. Sharing the gospel everywhere that he goes. So what does it mean to evangelize then? We see this great passage of Scripture showing us somebody who is doing what they've been commanded to do, but what does evangelism mean? I mean, from this passage of Scripture, we can clearly see it simply means sharing what we know from our own experience. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, at one time or another, you had to understand salvation. You had to understand that you were living a life of sin because the Bible says that we are all sinners. We're separated from God. It's your sin that separated you from God. And that God in His love and His mercy, He wanted to redeem you. He still wanted that. So He sent Jesus Christ, His Son, to earth to live a perfect and sinless life. And Jesus Christ submitted Himself to, the, to death on that cross. He died on that cross and shed His blood for, your, for the forgiveness of your sins. He was dead and He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again to life eternal, overcoming death and having life eternal. You had to understand that to become a follower of Christ. So all that evangelism is, is sharing what Jesus has done for us. You didn't do anything in there other than recognize that you're a sinner and ask God to forgive you for that. So 40 days, Jesus was here on earth for 40 days after his resurrection. By the way, remember we talked about 40 before the sermon. That's preparation time there. Preparation for Jesus to go into heaven, okay? Jesus is here for 40 days after his resurrection. And when he's getting ready to ascend into heaven, he's got the disciples or the apostles with him. And he gives what we know as the Great Commission. 
We find it in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Now listen, this is the last thing that Christ said to him before he goes to heaven. So I want you to listen closely to what this is saying because this applies to you and to me the same today as it did to them 2,000 years ago. Jesus said, Then came Jesus to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In the Great Commission, Jesus tells them to go and make disciples. Go! You can't make a disciple a follower of Jesus Christ, without them understanding who they're placing their faith in. The Great Commission is not the Great Suggestion. I mean, Jesus didn't gather His apostles around and said, hey, by the way, I'm getting ready to go on up into heaven. If you guys feel like it, if you ever get around to it, if somebody happens to bring it up in conversation, then you should share the good news about me. No, that's not what Jesus told them. Go back and reread that again. He said, go. Get out there. Go out there intentionally to make disciples. And that's the same great commission for you and for me today. Go. Get out there and make disciples. Will some of you be better than others at this? I hear, uh-huh. I disagree with you. I say that, some, that, that, that for some it will be different. I'm not going to say that it will be better, because by the way, as long as a sinner repents and comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who cares how we got them there? It matters that they still got there. Now I would say that some of you will be better, not better than others, but it'll be different. You see, God made each and every one of us distinctly different. And each and every one of us has a purpose. And we have gifts that God has given us. By the way, ironically, next week's service or next week's sermon is on service, where we are going to talk more specifically about the gifts that each and every one of us have. But listen, just because you have a different gift than I do, just because I love to get up in front of people and run my mouth and have everybody listen to me, just because that's my gift, it doesn't excuse you from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people that you run into every single day. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be doing the exact same thing because the Great Commission is to each and every one of us. All of us are in it together. We're all to go out there and be making disciples. Now listen, don't confuse what your role is in the disciple-making process. All that God, you can't save anybody. Nobody. Mike has never saved anybody. Steve has never saved anybody. Only God can do that through Jesus Christ. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. But you, you have a role in this process. Now, God may be drawing people to Jesus Christ, but I can tell you right now, God has done nothing since the beginning of time without the agency of man. God works through man. That means you have to physically get out there, go, and hit the streets and take the message of Christ to every single one of them. Now, I know that we don't have time today and, and it wasn't really the intent of this message, but again, all of us are gifted and have a different purpose in life. Not all evangelism is conducted in the same manner. Okay? 
I want to make sure that we get that down. There are some people like Cameron who are gifted to go out and to preach the gospel to other people who they have never seen before and they have no fear in that whatsoever. And then the rest of us are sitting there saying, uh -uh, not me, I'm not doing that. You're not putting me up in, a bun in front of a bunch of people that I don't know. And that's okay. God did not gift you in that way. He didn't make us all to be that way. But the way that God might have gifted you is maybe God has gifted you to share the good news of Jesus Christ with a child. Because I'm telling you right now, some people are not gifted to share with children. Maybe your gift is to connect with the elderly. Maybe you connect with people who struggle with addiction. Maybe you can connect with people who struggle with depression or abuse. Maybe your gift is to connect with the wealthy or the poor. Maybe the divorced. Maybe cancer survivors. The point is, we're not all gifted to connect with people in the same way. That's why God has a body of Christ made up of many different believers. You see, I can't connect with the same audience that you can because I've never lived your life. I don't have the same experiences in life that you have. You've never lived my life. You don't have the same experiences that I have. We've all got different gifts and different experiences. But here's the thing. It does not relieve you from the fact that you are commanded to go and make disciples. That is what we are called to do. And here's the thing. If you have said that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord, if you've accepted Him as your Savior, by the way, you can't just accept Him as your Savior and not as your Lord, okay? And the, these are two different things that are miles apart. He can be your Savior in one specific instance, and He'll be your Savior forever. I got it. But He's your Lord every single day. When you say that Jesus Christ is your Lord, it means... I'm going to actually obey you. I'm going to do what it is that you're telling me to do. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're sitting here right now, if you're tuned in online right now, if you're watching this, and you say, yes, I am a child of God. I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Then please listen to me. And make sure you don't leave without understanding this. One of these days, you will stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says, there is therefore, in Romans 8.1, it says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, wait, Steve, you just told us we're going to stand before Christ one of these days and answer. And you are. You're going to answer for what you have done from the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior for what you did with it after that. It doesn't mean that you're going to be condemned. You're not going to be condemned to go to hell. That is not what it's talking about because the Bible says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But please don't walk out this door and think, oh, hey, I'm good to go. I'm scot-free. Got me some Jesus today. It's all good. Let's head out to the bar. We're going to be there for the rest of the week. Call me when it's church time again. It's not how it works. You can't come here and have Jesus today and go out there and live like the rest of the world. It don't work that way. So listen, I told you guys, during the sermon, everybody you see, you're going to look at them with an E. And that's what I want to leave you with today. I want to leave each and every one of you with an E. Because I don't know 
If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, I don't know if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior. So I say this, if you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I beg you, don't wait another minute. Because you are not guaranteed another minute on this earth. I gave you the Gospel in this sermon. You know what Jesus has done for you. If you know that you are a sinner separated from God, what are you waiting on? Give your life to Christ. Ask Him to be your Savior. Dedicate your life to Him. Now, if you've already done that, I'm looking at you with the other E. I want to encourage you. I want to leave you with some encouragement. God's not asking you to be the next Billy Graham. He's not asking you to go out and, and buy a big top tent that's going to fit 10,000 people under it. He's not asking you to do that. But He is commanding you to go and make disciples. In your workplace, go and make disciples. In your household, go and make disciples. With the people that you meet, go and make disciples. With your friends, go and make disciples. By the way, remember, they may have already accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I am glad that they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But I'm telling you right now, our religious institutions throughout this nation are full of people today who are not disciples of Jesus Christ. Go! Make disciples! If they don't know the Lord, introduce them. If they do know the Lord, encourage them. Help them get into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why I'm always asking you guys, please join one of our small groups. Come and join us. Do something outside of this one hour a week that we get together. Come and join us. Let's go. Let's be His disciples. We are His hands. We're His feet. We're His mouth in this earth. And that's what He's called us to do. I'm going to leave you with this one last passage. Our backdrop here is to remind us, I keep, I keep pointing up to it, that Christ encourages us in John chapter 4, verses 35 through 38. Listen to what He says. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and a harvest and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and the other reaps, is true. I sent you to reap that that you have not, that you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. The Holy Spirit's already been out there preparing these people. The harvest is ripe. Let's go out into that hurting and dying world. Let's go and give people hope. And the only hope that there is, is in Jesus Christ. Let's go out there and be the salt and the light and show them our love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we, as we end our service today, Lord, we just pray that that You would help us to recognize, Holy Spirit, that You would, that you would be active in our lives and, and, and help us to be sensitive to Your guidance, Lord. We just pray that, that You would help us to see opportunities in our lives. Lord, that You would make us sensitive to look for opportunities in our lives to share the Gospel, Lord. Make each and every one of us an effective evangelist. Father God, help us. We know that we have the answer. We are like blind beggars who are just going to show everybody else where we found the bread. Father God, help us to do this. Help us to become effective in our witness for You. And God, we just, we just pray that everything that we do is in Your name and it brings glory to You. In the precious name of Jesus we pray.